again. Likewise. More fun. Great deal of fun. Okay, Mr. Chair, we are live. All right, thank you. Good morning, uh, or good afternoon, excuse me. Uh, we'll call this meeting to order of the Committee on Guidelines for Negotiation. I'm Isaac Benton, uh, currently the chair. And uh, let's go around the horn and introduce ourselves, uh, folks in the conference room or at the mayor's office, wherever that is. Uh, good afternoon, this is Mike Pulley. I'm the uh, chief of staff for the mayor. Michael Dorn, I'm the labor liaison for the city of Albuquerque. Good afternoon, Stephanie. Hi, I'm Stephanie Gomez, clerical uh, local 2962 president. Mr. Nichols. I'm Brian Nichols with the Models Berlin Law Firm. I'm the lead negotiator for the city of Albuquerque for at least some of the collective bargaining agreements. Thank you, Councilor Jones. Thank you, Trudy Jones, Albuquerque City Council. Councilor Peeblecorn. Hi everybody, Tammy Peeblecorn, District 7 City Councilor. And Mr. Davis. Florence Davis, City Budget Officer. And Mr. Romero. Good afternoon, Anthony Romero, Human Resources Department. And Diane Kimberly, Human Resources Department, Employee Labor Relations. Hello. Hi, good afternoon, Councilor. Good afternoon, Mr. Gutierrez. Good afternoon, Councilor Ben, thank you. Uh, Rocky Gutierrez, Ask Me Council 18 Assistant Director, thank you. Mr. Padilla. Mr. Padilla, President of uh, the Blue Collar City of Albuquerque and uh, president of Transit Bus Driver. Okay, and let's see. Uh, I'll go on. Uh, Julian Moya is our council technical person. Mandy Nohos, our staff. Tomas Romero. Tomas, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, Councillor Benton. Uh, Tomas Romero. I'm asking me local 1888 with the security unit. Thank you, sir. And Julia. Hi, everyone. Julia Kuladon, Associate Counsel for City Council Services. Jane. Hello, I'm Jane Aranda. I'm with the Budget Office. Thank you. And Linda. Hello, Linda. Can you introduce yourself? Can you hear me? There you go. Oh, good. Yes, I'm Linda Padilla, and I'm with the Budget Office. All right, thank you. All right, we'll get started. Uh, first on our agenda is the election of chair. I think we have, uh, if I'm mistaken, these type of uh, committees, if I'm not mistaken, these type of committees where we have the administration and the council equally uh, represented, uh, we alternate. So I'm going office chair this year. I believe Mr. Davis was um, vice chair previously, just for your information, or perhaps for his ambitious move up, if he is so willing. But that's just a suggestion. So uh, I'll open the floor to uh, nominations for chair. Mr. Chair, I'd like to nominate Mr. Doran, who's the current vice president. Okay, very good. That thank you. I, I I've forgotten that it is Mr. Dorn. So if he's willing, Mr. Dorn, how about you? Yes, sir. I accept. Okay, thanks. Well, I'll move that we uh, accept Mr. Dorn by acclamation. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Is a second. Let's just go around the horn. Uh, let's see if the voting members. Let me get my. <laughs> Or uh, maybe if Mandy has that handy, she could call the vote. I do, Councillor. Okay, okay Councillor Benton. Yes. Mr. Doran. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Mr. Pulley. Yes. Councillor Feeblecorn. Yes. Mr. Davis. Yes. Passes unanimously. Thank you, Mandy. 
we'll uh, we'll turn it over to Mr. Dorn, if you're willing, sir. Thank you, Councillor. I appreciate that, and I appreciate the vote of confidence. Uh, first on the agenda is the approval of the October 5th, 2021 summary minutes, uh, which were attached with the invite. Um, I move that we, um, uh, for approval of the agenda. Do I have a second? Second. We have a second. Um, I call for a vote for approval. Mandy? Councilor Benton. <coughs> Mr. Doran. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Mr. Pulley. Yes. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Mr. Davis. Yes. That passes unanimously. Thank you, that passes. On to um, item number three, discussion of pending or potential negotiations. We do have an opening from AFSME 1888 and 2962. Um, so far, we have not received an opening from 624 or 624 Transit. We are currently with NIFF's uh, negotiations as well as APD Transport. Um, APD as a whole does not open this year. Um, neither does 3022M series. I would, um, we have asked the unions here to discuss if, um, to make a presentation to the committee, reference um, any um, upcoming negotiations. Mr. Uh, Romero, are you uh, ready to proceed with a presentation or Mr. Gutierrez? Yes. Yes, Mike, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. This is, this is Tomas Romero. I wasn't sure if Rocky had a verbal uh, presentation to give. Do you, um, did you, do you need yes. a screen for a PowerPoint or anything? Uh, no, sir. We have, um, if, if I'm not sure if the Moss has a presentation, but I would like to make a uh, brief presentation. Um, uh, and then I'll pass it over to the presidents for any further comments they would like to make. Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. Go ahead when you're ready. Okay, thank you. So on behalf of AFSCME Locals, I thank you all for your time. Uh, for the following reason, reasons, AFSCME is requesting at least an 8 to 10% increase to employees' wages. The dollar had an average inflation rate of 8.5% in the last 12 months. $1 in 2021 is equivalent in purchasing power to about $1.06 today. As a result, the real value of the dollar has been decreasing recently. Uh, $16 in 2021 is equivalent in purchasing power to about $16.98 today. That's a devaluation equivalent to an employee making $16 an hour to now making $15.02 an hour. A dollar today only buys 94.340% of what it could buy a year ago. A 2% a increase would relieve only 32 cents of that 16 wage level deficit. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics Consumer Price Index, today's prices are 1.06 times higher than average prices since 2021. Uh, the 2021 inflation rate was 4.70%. The current inflation rate compared to last year's is now 8.54%. If this inflation rate trends holds, $1 today will be equivalent in buying power to $1.09 uh, next year because the dollar will continue to lose value for some employees making a wage of $16.32 an hour. That's a de uh, devaluation equivalent to making $14.85, a loss of $1.46 an hour. An increase of 8% on a $16 wage with a $14.85 equivalent, excuse me, equivalent, excuse me, evaluation is $1.22 for a total dollar evaluation of $16.07. Even with an 8% increase, an employee making $16 an hour is merely breaking even in today's price market. Contributors to inflation are food and beverages at 5.23%, housing at 3.94%, 
apparel at 4.93%, transportation at, a, at an increase of 10.71%, Medicare, medical care at 2.28%, recreation, education, and communication, and other goods and services totaling 7.57%. And here are some product increases costs from March 2021 to present. Gas prices increased from $2.33 per gallon to $4.31 per gallon. Electricity prices increased from 14 cents per kilowatt hour to 15 cents. Grain and oil seed is up 28%. Feed grain is up 33%. Corn is up $1.7 a bushel. Food grain is up 44%. Wheat, 77 cents a bushel. Vegetable and melon, up 68%. Some vegetables have declined, such as broccoli, tomato, carrots, and sweet corn. But those costs are offset by price increases for lettuce, onion, cauliflower, and celery. Meat is up 20%. Dairy is up 50%. Poultry and egg, up 76%. Fruit and food, up 3.6%. Annual raises help employees plan and budget for their monthly expenses by helping them keep up with the cost of living. With the rate of inflation and no sufficient wage increase to compensate for the loss, employees will have to determine where, the, where to cut costs. Do they make those cuts in food, transportation, living conditions, etc.? Some employees are making the decision to find other employment opportunities that pay more. Voluntary over turnover, excuse me, voluntary turnovers are costly. According to Gallup, for hourly workers, it costs an average of $1,500 per employee, but employers may have to spend between half and two times a departing employee's annual salary. With just a 100 person organization, that provides an average, that provides an average of fifty thousand a year. Could have a ton, excuse me, turnover and replacement cost of approximately six hundred and sixty thousand to two point six million dollars per year. But sometimes it is more than money. The city, the city is then forced to dedicate time to resources, to recruiting, integrating employees, and training new hires after an employee leaves. Plus, the city simultaneously takes a hit internally while the position remains unfilled. The city potentially loses good employees. Potentially losing good employees means losing trained and experienced individuals who are very effective at their job, which ultimately creates relations with the public. For all these reasons, um, we, we are asking that city council and the administration highly consider at least an eight to 10% wage increase across the board for all employees within AFSCME. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. Appreciate that presentation. Do any of the counselors or any of the committee have any questions for Mr. Gutierrez? I'll ask, I'll ask a question, Mr. Gutierrez. Um, just, are you guys looking at just eight to 10 across the board? Or are you looking at using that money to target, you know, certain um, occupations or it, to longevity or how are, how are you looking to, what are you looking to do with the money? Well, right now that is an across the board um, uh, request. What we may be looking at as well are base increases. As we know, um, outside companies, other agencies are, uh, increasing their base wage to at least fifteen to sixteen dollars an hour, and we may have some employees making less than that. So we need to look at individual positions making less than fifteen dollars an hour, and then at that point consider the evaluation of the eight to ten percent increase. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any other um, questions or comments from the committee? Uh, we'll move yes. on to you, Mr. I'm sorry, go ahead, uh, Councillor Benton. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Dorn. Just to follow up on, on your question, I, I, this may not be as applicable uh, necessarily uh, uh, to 
to Mr. Gutierrez's presentation, but there are some positions we know, they're probably more in the M series where um, we're having a really hard time uh, competing. I don't know if we're gonna be able to compete honestly, uh, because uh, some of these uh, kind of project manager type um, management can get that positions. Just, we don't have to be able to get to work um, But uh, But I just maybe ask uh, Rocky if he would comment on that or, or you know, uh, again, just, just the the difficult ones where it's a, it's a society wide uh, uh, shortage of, of certain positions. Yes, sir. And, uh, and I apologize. I don't know if it's my connection. I was kind of going in and out a little bit there. I think I heard most of it uh, specifically about the competition in the M series versus possibly other professional and technical positions. Um, I agree with you. Um, we are in a very competitive uh, environment right now where the city is uh, competing with other uh, public entities, other private entities, um, you know, and looking at the regional comparisons, unfortunately, the city and, and other public entities are falling below average on those, on those um, wages. Uh, we seriously need to look at the, the market value of the wages, the comparison regionally, and, and start matching these, or we're gonna lose some very good um, managers, and we may lose some motivation of employees to move up the ladder to those positions if they can make more in another, in another facility, another area or business. Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez, appreciate that. Uh, question? Oh, I'm sorry, please sorry. go ahead. I, I'm just curious, thank you, Mr. Gutierrez, for that presentation. I, I heard you say that you think there are some of your workers that are at less than $15 an hour base pay. Can you um, elaborate on that and tell me how many and what percentage we're looking at? I, thank you, ma'am. I could not give you the exact, exact number now. Um, but I can look that up and provide that to you if you'd like. I, I would like that very much. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Counselor. If anybody does, nobody has any more questions, uh, we'll move on to Tomas. Uh, if you wanted to make a presentation for 1888. Hello, President Doran. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I can. Okay. Mike, no, I just, uh, I just want to concur with uh, our rep, Rocky Gutierrez's uh, assessment on the, uh, on the wages. So I'm just going to stick, we're going to stick with that. Okay. Any questions for President Romero? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to uh, President Stephanie Gomez of 2962. This is the C-Series, the Clerical Union. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going based off what Rocky's already uh, brought to you. Um, so I have a small presentation um, regarding, touching on the same topics. Uh, Local 2962 for the clerical uh, employees, uh, we are requesting um, a bump in pay because I have several um, employees that are, they are making less than $15 an hour. For example, I can give you the telephone reporting unit. They are making $13.45 an hour. Um, and that's just not a reasonable living wage, uh, especially with yeah, they've had 3% in the last contract negotiations, but with the rise in healthcare in our health, our health or the cost of healthcare for us, they never really saw that um, benefit of that 3%. Um, so since coming into office uh, for as clerical president, um, that's been the number one issue that have come to me is a living wage with the cost of 
uh, groceries going up, the cost of gas going up. It's been fortunate that some people have been able to work from home, so they don't have to worry about allocating money and, and you know, to be able to make it to work every day, not including, you know, going to their families, you know, extracurricular functions for their children or for school activities. Um, but like I said, telephone reporting units making $13.45 an hour um, at entry level, and they want experience, you know, clerical experience. I actually called around locally to the fast food um, restaurants around McDonald's starting at 12, Burger King at 1275, Starbucks at 13, Chick-fil-A at 1150. And, you know, these are on the low end, but with the staffing deficit, they're definitely, asked, you know, willing to pay more. And these are, they're hiring at 16 years old with no experience. So they're getting paid almost as much as the people that are working for the city that are required experience. Um, I can also say that working with the city, they're also getting health benefits, retirement, longevity. Um, but like I said, they never saw that, uh, that raise from the contract negotiations because of the rise in health. And I can't even get a lot of these clerical employees to even join the union. 20, 20 34 for per pay period, they just don't see that as being feasible to pay towards the union because like I said, that goes towards gas, that's going towards groceries. And you know, $20, you know, the cost of eggs went from $2.99 an 18 pack to now $4.62 for an 18 pack. You know, that's extra money for them. Um, which is, you know, it doesn't benefit them because the union's offering all this free college for their, for them and for their immediate family members, which they can use to, um, you know, in, you know, proceed to go up the ladder in their employee, you know, their career ladder. Um, I have a small little blurb that I got from the telephone reporting unit um, when they were asking, you know, if there was anything that I could do about getting more money for them. Um, and this is uh, what they had to collectively say. We also have several individuals preparing to depart TRU for other positions within the city of Albuquerque that have higher wages or other companies that have higher wages. While we love helping citizens at the telephone reporting unit, we cannot ignore the fact that our pay does not reflect the current economic cost of living and the competitive market pay. It is becoming increasingly hard to keep up the positive morale when we have individuals struggling to cover household expenses, pay bills, and keep up with the record inflation that has affected the cost of food and gas the most. Um, so again, we re I formally request that we can at least get these people to a, a minimum of $16 an hour um, to cover that and you know, also uh, an eight to 10% across the board increase. Thank you, President Gomez. Do we have any questions or comments for President Gomez? Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Davis. <laughs> Quick, not really a question, just a comment. And, you know, I do have to disclose, this is why I say this, this is why I kind of uh, always ask this question. And I know a, a lot of the times, uh, when we go out and compare ourselves, we like to compare ourselves to our peers and public peers mostly. But I know we have a very powerful tool, tool here, which is our defined benefit program through PARA. Do we, when we go out and actively recruit, um, and I know in forms of total compensation, it doesn't even show up. Um, do we market this, this outstanding benefit? Because I'm just going to take an example. If I'm making $20 an hour here, and, you know, I'm in a technical position, but the private industry may be offering $30 an hour. Um, and, you know, that, that's a big difference. Um, and I'll speak for, you know, a lot of the younger individuals kind of coming out of college or out of high school. And they say, oh, hey, you know, it's a big difference. I want the $30 an hour. But what they don't know and what they can't see and what we're probably going to have to educate them on are, there's a big difference between going to a private industry, having a 401k and, you know, having that money in their specified kind of retirement versus a defined benefit program where they come here, earn a little less, have outstanding benefits, have a defined benefit program, which, you know, is, is we all know it's a property right. It's guaranteed for life, not only for us, but for our beneficiaries. 
And I guess that's a long way of saying we have an outstanding benefit package here. And do we market that to these individuals that we're trying to attract to the city? Thank you, Mr. Davis. Um, Mr. Um, we have our HR director, Anthony Romero on. Can you um, speak to that, Mr. Romero? Thank you, that, that's a, a great point. And we're looking at, you know, incorporating that in our messaging as we go out more and more, especially through new tools that we are using, such as the employee hiring bus. When we're out there just letting folks know about that package. I think a lot of us on this call can also relate to the fact that a lot of those attitudes are changing. I'm seeing that a lot with a lot of the, the younger folks that are looking to enter the market. They're not as interested in you know thinking, am I gonna be here for 30 more years to take advantage of that defined um, benefit? I know like myself, I started in 99, right? So I'm approaching year 23, close to year 25. I remember thinking, after I graduated from UNM, there's no way I'll be with the city of Albuquerque in 2024 and look at where we're at, right? So doing some um, uh, um, marketing with that a little bit more is gonna be helpful. And I think that I'm really uh, happy to say that, you know, having some discussions with Rocky Gutierrez and Diane and how do we start bridging the, the gap with the union and we're actually gonna be hosting a partnership um, at the Union Hall where we take out the hiring bus so that we can start um, that, that discussion um, and also maybe doing some brown bag lunch and learns for high school students or students in um, tech schools that want to be able to hear from both the city and the union what the um, pros are for being a public servant. Uh, every time that I'm out, I 100% am advocating on behalf of what it's like to be a public servant. I started from uh, getting my degree at UNM and have promoted through, through the ranks here at the city. And it's been an aw awesome opportunity because it really looks like I have an opportunity to work for several different companies, you know, working at the transit department to family and community services, senior affairs, now HR. So there's a, 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 a huge wealth of um, places to go, but you're, you're speaking just right, Lawrence, is we, we got to do a better job at um, informing folks of those benefits. And I'm very um, hopeful to the partnerships that we're going to have with HR and the union to make sure that we, um, in a spirit of partnership, uh, communicate that to prospective coworkers that we'll have. Thank you, Director Romero. Any more questions or comments for Mr. Davis's, Mr. Gutierrez? Thank you. Uh, I, Mr. Davis, I don't agree with you, at, or excuse me, disagree with you at all. Uh, we understand the burden rate on top of the wage is supplements a lot of costs for healthcare, uh, other benefits that other employees may pay in the private sector. Unfortunately, I, I, at this point, it seems like uh, the consumer price index, the cost of everything that's going on has created short-sightedness for those types of benefits because the employee is looking at what they have in their pocket and how they're going to support themselves today. You know, um, I, you know, yes, having a 25-year career, 30-year career with the city is a wonderful thing to be able to look long-term. But if we don't address the immediate need, I think we're, the city is really going to have a hard time uh, retaining those employees, and it has to come with the competitiveness of wages. I mean, we're seeing it across the board because of the state uh, mandatory uh, minimum wage. Um, other entities, small businesses are increasing their wages simply to hold on to those employees. I know some employers that they only have two or three employees, and they're increasing their wage because these employees are going for the jobs for higher higher wages. Uh, because they're out there now, not the benefits. They're young. They think they're going to live forever. We were all there. Uh, so they don't see it yet. You know, I think a time will come where they'll realize, and that is part of the education piece I think you're talking about, letting them know, hey, this is important as well. But if we don't meet the need, immediate need now, I think we are going to um, hit those crossroads. 
Um, so thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. Do we have any more questions or comments? All right, we'll move along to uh, President Casey Padilla of 624 and 624 Transit uh, Unions. Mr. Padilla, you go ahead. Yeah. All right, thank you, Chairman Michael Doran. Um, you know, so just real quick, I wanted to kind of point out that in our collective bargaining agreement, um, actually, we don't, we're not opening the full contract this round. It's only financial. So as far as us sending an opener, uh, the contract just said that there would be discussions with the administration. And in the end, whatever the budget approved is what we would get across the board. So we weren't looking for any specific areas or specific raises for certain groups. I believe we took care of transit, which was a huge one this last go round. So that's the reason for no letter at this time, because I believe the contract already leaves it open for those discussions for FY23. Um, one thing I would like to point out also, apart with Rocky's presentation, thank you for that, Rocky, I appreciate that. Um, I would ask that, you know, we could look at the big picture. You know, I, I don't want to, you know, build ourselves in a box and start looking at, you know, the benefits of what people get in this stuff. I think we're at a point where it's getting hard for people to afford things, even with those benefits to where they're making decisions that those benefits aren't enough because they can't put food on the table, you know. Over the last 12 years, we went five and a half years at one point in the beginning of the last administration with no raises for any employees. Uh, during COVID, we went another year without any kind of, um, you know, so looking at it, even at the eight to 10%, I mean, that's a minimum. You know, I think we, we've lost our competitiveness. We're having a hard time hiring and hiring in certain positions that you never had these issues before. Solid waste is having a hard time even bringing people in to come and even pick up the trash, you know. So there's a there's a lot of things that, you know, I would ask that the, the city council would look at, this board would look at, this guidelines committee to as far as the big picture, you know, where we really sit at, right? I mean, like I said, it, it's been a long 12 years over the last 12 years. You know, when this, this administration came in for the first term, I actually had a meeting with Sarita Nair. And uh, I gave her a paycheck from 2010 and a paycheck from 2000 and I believe 19 at the time. And I was making the exact same amount of money over 10 years in my position at Solid Waste. You know, so I think coming, you know, here today, you know, asking for an 8 to 10 percent, I think that's the minimum. But I would ask that, you know, the, the big picture of it, let's look at the scheme of things over the last 12 years. We have lost our competitiveness. The, the Bernalillo County is doing an audit on their employees right now uh, you know, to see where people are falling in. Uh, they've given 8 and 10% raises to a lot of areas over the last few years to where we've got a 1%, 2%. We finally got a 3%, you know, this last time. But I think, you know what, if the city of Albuquerque wants to, uh, you know, be able to function and provide the services that the taxpayers pay for, there needs to be a bump in pay to have these services provided at 100%. We shouldn't be operating in a lot of these departments with 10 to 15 percent less of employees. We need to have these positions filled to provide these services to the city of Albuquerque. And that's all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Casey. I appreciate that. Just um, full disclosure, we missed the first 30 seconds of it of your presentation, but we'll go back and watch it. Uh, technical errors. So. Yeah. Uh, is there any questions or comments for President Padilla? Okay. Um, as I don't see any questions, uh, we'll move on to the next um, piece of this that we do have our chief negotiator, Brian Nichols here. Um, due to the guidelines, the um, municipal code, uh, we cannot discuss ongoing negotiations or any details um, as to what's going on within negotiations. But Mr. Nichols, could you just give a general overview of the negotiations as they stand? Sure. I think one interest of the city in negotiations has been to get longer term contracts. Uh, I think the city spends a lot of money uh, year to year negotiating collective bargaining agreements when it is reasonable and common in the industries, public and private sector, to have contracts that run two to four years. So we've been trying to um, in increase the duration of the contract. And like uh, 
uh, old Casey said, you know, we did some with wage openers and some that were completely closed this year. <clears throat> so APOA is completely closed. APOA sworn. APOA prisoner transport is completely open. That's the one contract that's completely open. Um, the only thing remaining in that contract is compensation. We're working on it. Uh, firefighters, IAFF, uh, compensation is open, really just wages. You know, it's a section of the collective bargaining agreement that gets, is a, that's allowed to be opened. So, you know, it's more than just hourly wage, but, and it's less than all of compensation. You know, kind of as Mr. Davis said, compensation is, you're not an at-will employee. You have paid time off. You have benefits. You have all kinds of city policies, incentives about academics, um, all kinds of compensation uh, criteria. But what can be opened is essentially wages and longevity. That's the short version. It varies from contract to contract. So uh, IAFF, uh, clerical, and security have opened those terms. Um, Casey has not opened the contracts for blue collar or transit. I think he's right that what the city council decides, um, you know, applies. Uh, each contract states that although, although there is negotiations, uh, any agreement is subject to approval and appropriation by the city council, any wage agreement compensation agreement is subject to appropriation and approval by the city council. So I also agree with Casey that, you know, we did a lot with the transit drivers last year. Uh, we did a lot with security officers in several past negotiations. Um, and so that doesn't mean anything more than that, except that those employees, you know, I think, Casey and I have locked horns um, repeatedly over four years about the Barry administration. And, you know, I've told him time and time again, like, that's not the administration that I am contracted with to do business for. You know, I, I'm not saying things were good under the Barry administration, but you need to deal with this administration square up. How are we doing? Uh, and this administration square up has given quite accelerated pay raises to several bargaining units, not all bargaining units, but several. So I don't, um, in the past, I'm only talking about the past. I'm not talking about what the council should do in, in its appropriation here. I'm not talking about what we should do in negotiations. I'm just saying that the current administration over the past four years have provided significant pay increases to several of the bargaining, the eight bargaining units. So, Unless you have questions for me, Mr. Doran, or any of the city councilors, of course, administration. Rocky and Casey are probably texting me, telling me to, that I'm wrong and I should be quiet. So maybe I will. I'll surprise I them. I have a question. Um, could you just uh, give me that I'm, I'm the newest counselor here. Could you give me the background on what the raises have been over the in the the last four years in the first term of this administration and for which bargaining units? Yeah, uh, I can't give you the percentages, Counselor. Uh, we probably, probably HR can do that better than I can, although I can do it the best I can off the top of my head. So I can tell you this, the collective, bar the, the bargaining units which have run ahead of the general appropriation are security, transit, prisoner transport, sworn officers, and firefighters. Now, not necessarily all of them to the same level, but, you know, 1888 has gotten increases in compensation in excess of the general appropriation. I'm not saying it's enough. I'm not saying it's too much. I'm just saying that's what, that's what it's been. Uh, Sworn police officers, the same. Prisoner transport, the same. Uh, transit drivers, the same. And firefighters, less so, but still the same. The firefighters, uh, 
you know, to some degree for their perspective is different than mine. My perspective is, for instance, last year, while they got a 3% across the board wage increase, their overall compensation increase was about five, five and a half percent. That included a para pickup, that included some other stuff they negotiated. They didn't negotiate it all in one big package. It wasn't an eye popping number that everyone could easily understand. But when you piece all the different things they did together, it increased. So I don't know. I'd have to go back. I don't think that I would be the right person to give you precise numbers, uh, counselor, but those are the bargaining units that have run ahead of the general appropriation. Thank you. Sure. So I get, let me say this. So that leaves M series, clerical, and probably blue collar running at about appropriation. You know, I think every bargaining unit has gotten some uh, bells and whistles here and there. Uh, you know, this has been an administration that, for instance, would kick in academic incentive pay or get a degree incentives or those kinds of things. Um, but I would say that those are the three bargaining units that have run at about the appropriation level. But most of them have run ahead, to be honest, in my view. That's my opinion. Do we have any more questions for Mr. Nichols? <laughs> you can call me Nichols. That's fine. I, okay, Nichols. I don't stand on formality too well. I did put on a jacket. I feel very proud of myself. I don't have a question, but I do have a comment, if I may. Um, I, I do want to agree with Brian on the past few years. There have been a couple positions that the city has worked with us very well to increase their wages. They, they saw there was a need, um, and they helped us meet that need. So this isn't all gloom and doom from us, by no means. Let's, let's be... Uh, honest about that. Um, you know, there has been uh, some raises, as Brian had said, part of the appropriations and some agreements outside of those in order to meet this need. Uh, so I, I do want to say that. And the city, we, are, we have been working well together on certain positions. Uh, but also, I think we need to start focusing on a lot of these other positions. Um, and I, I apologize, Counselor, I'm trying to pronounce your name. Um, feel Bitcoin? I assume that's me you're talking to. Feeble corn. Feeble corn. Thank you, ma'am. Um, uh, an immediate look at what I was seeing from clerical. We do have it look like at least, I'm, I'm, this is a brief estimate, about 15% of the employees, but I'll give you actual positions and numbers, okay, uh, that are making less than 15. Some making 13, some at 14, some really close to 15 from what I've seen. We have individuals in blue collar, specifically custodians, uh, making less than 15. Um, so this is just the base. I mean, let's let's be straight. I, I don't want to repeat myself too much. That's just the base. I mean, that's just to get them at a decent wage at 15. But we, as Casey said, that's eight to 10 is the minimum for especially some of these employees making less than 15. I don't know how anyone in this day really can, especially with a family, you know, sustain themselves. So we need to really focus on some of these positions, as I mentioned before, um, looking at the base wage and then some of the other positions to bring them up to be competitive. But uh, Brian, thank you for uh, your comments and I, I appreciate your work. Thank you. You bet, Rock. Rocky and I do pretty good. Councilor Feeble, uh, Corn, I think it's fair to, what Rocky said is fair and there's probably even a reason for it. Your clerical employees, your blue collar employees and your M series employees are spread across the departments in your city. So uh, regardless of skill level, and I think it's probably pretty fair to say that there's some obviously some differences in skill levels within those bargaining units. They're not, they're unusual bargaining units in the sense that people do a broad variety of tasks within those bargaining units. So for your blue collar, it runs from your sanitation workers to your mechanics, to your laborers, to your uh, you know, custodians, sorry, to your parks people, okay? Your clerical is gonna run just all across the board. Your M series is gonna run from engineers to supervisor, to frontline supervisors. So 
probably the reason why, to be candid, those employees have not received um, the attention and therefore the increases that some other employees have is they don't have a precise um, advocate. You know, transit, you've got a transit director. Your transit director says, I need bus drivers, I need blah, 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 whatever the, it is that the transit director says. You've got a police chief, you've got a fire chief. Uh, so those, those employees have more, I think it's fair to say, have more of an advocate within the administration than the employees that are spread across departments. That's a little bit less true with Blue Collar, to be honest, because Rocky and Casey are both Blue Collar alum and you know, kind of their heart goes out to them on a regular basis. You know, Mr. Doran, Mike is uh, a clerical alum. So there's some, there's some focus there, but I, I do think it's fair to say it just occurred to me while Rocky was speaking that, you know, those are your bargaining units that are spread across departments and they, they probably have not gotten the attention now. Little, little parts do like your 911 um, operators got some pretty significant raises two years ago, three years ago, pre-COVID in the clerical unit. But as a whole, you know, you're not, I don't think you have a department head that will shake the trees and pay attention to those employees in the way that fire, police, uh, transit, and security do. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. Do we have any um, further questions or comments for Mr. Nichols? Mr. Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me lower my hand. Um, more of a comment for Councilor Feeblecorn. We work with uh, the HR department to insert a table every year in the budget document. And Councilor, if you go to last year's budget document, it's on page 38 that captures all these increases. And it's the, the table's titled Compensation by Bargaining Unit. It provides a summary for you over, uh, I think we include 10 years on this table, in this table. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry about that. Hey, Mr. Uh, President Padilla, I saw you had your hand up as well. Okay, real quick uh, to Brian's comments. Uh, for the record, Brian, uh, you brought up Barry, I didn't. <laughs> and I will be texting you here in a little bit. But no, and I mean, and to add to Rocky's point also, I mean, the administration has worked with us well, you know, with the transit unit. I think we made big strides in that area for them to raise them up to somewhere where they could actually afford a, a home and a car, you know, and be able to, you know, live their lives, right? But uh, but no, it hasn't been doom and gloom. You know, I agree with the comment also with Rocky, but we have been able to work with one another well. Um, you know, just my point was the big picture of how far behind we were, the competitiveness, and you know, moving forward and trying to fill these positions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Padilla. Uh, President Gomez, I see you have your hand up. Um, yeah, and just to touch on what Brian Nichols said, uh, you're probably right. There hasn't been an advocate for the clerical, uh, you know, bargaining unit. Um, fortunately, I do come from 911 communications. I've um, been there 14 years, and now that I'm the president, I'm trying to advocate for those. Um, not necessarily with 911 Communications because the actually city worked with us just this year and got us a significant raise um, that was well earned considering all the employees at 911 Communications are working 50, 60, 70 plus hours a week. Some man, mostly mandated, some voluntary. Um, but as far as the other uh, uh, employees that fall under clerical, um, you're right. They haven't been um, addressed. They haven't been, you know, they haven't received that compensation. And um, with the staffing deficit, they've been taking on new duties to cover for those positions that are uh, not filled. And I like said that, so that's, that's what I'm here for. I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to speak on their behalf. I'm trying to be an advocate for them um, because it's, it's due time for them to get some more money. And it's, it's sad that you know, when I've got people making $13 an hour, I mean, what that doesn't really pay for anything. You need at least two met two working household members full time to make to compensate. You can't even buy a house right now, much less rent a house. 
Thank you, President Gomez. Any questions or comments for President Gomez? Any more comments or questions in general? Okay, I, um, according to 328 of the um, LMRO B, uh, the guidelines committee shall meet in closed session with appropriate staff in accordance with the New Mexico Open Meetings Act as necessary to discuss bargaining strategy of preliminary to collective bargaining negotiations between the city and the employee organizations. I move that the guidelines committee moves into executive session with the negotiations um, with the city negotiations team to discuss um, bargaining strategy for the upcoming negotiations. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Um, do we take a vote on that or is that, I'm sorry. Mr. Chair, yes, you're gonna need to take a roll call vote and our staff will take the vote. Uh, Mandy, do you wanna go ahead and take that roll call at this point? Thank you, Mr. Melindros. Okay, Councilor Benton. Councilor Benton. Sorry, I was muted, yes. Thank you, Mr. Doran. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Mr. Pulley. Yes. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Mr. Davis. Yes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, can we move into executive session with um, the guidelines committee and the um, negotiation team, please? Good to see everyone. Bye. Hey, um, <clears throat> Michael, I'm here on uh, behalf of City Legal, so I probably should, should be in breakout as well. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mr. Chair. Chair. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Chris. Um, so we'll in general, we'll take the committee Thank into you. session, uh, representatives from, from city legal, the city's negotiator and council staff as well. So Julian, for your purposes, that's all of the committee members, myself, Ms. Kuladon, uh, Mr. Pennington from city legal and uh, our negotiator, Mr. Nichols. Got it. <clears throat> Give me one moment and I'll have uh, everybody in a breakout room. Uh, just a question. So for the sake of presentation and the piece, will the committee be coming back with comments or questions or are we good to log off? Yes, sir. We will come back um, from um, executive session and we'll take uh, further last comments or questions. Okay. No, no, I don't have any other comments or questions, but will the committee come back with further need for questions or are we okay to log off or do you want us to hold on? I would ask that um, at least um, yourself, Mr. Gutierrez, since you can answer for all of the AFSMEs, that if you um, can hang on in case we have any questions or comments for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir.
I told Rocky and Casey we're back, so okay, it should come. I was gonna yank their chain and tell them, well, it's just like we're at the Union Hall, and you guys are like down the hall eating popcorn and cookies while the city negotiating team is waiting. <laughs> we turn up the heat too. I don't know if you realize that yet, but. <laughs> All right. Do we make a motion? I'm sorry. Do we make a motion to go back into a general session or just affirm that we, in fact, did only spoke um, reference the strategies for any bargaining units not already opened? In that case, that I affirm that that's um, we did in the executive session. We did only discuss um, bargaining strategy, bargaining strategy preliminary to. Um, any um, units not opened. Do and they do we need a vote, correct, Mr. Melendrez, to come out of executive? Oh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Davis, no, you do not. Uh, okay. to go in and uh, you can proceed with uh, the rest of the meeting at this point without additional votes. Thanks, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, I do move us on to number four on the agenda, other business. Do I, I have nothing on the agenda as under, under other business. Um, do any of, do, do we have any questions or comments before we end this meeting? I just have a quick question. We, we voted on a um, chair, but do we need a vice chair? Mr. Chair, um, Councilor People Corn, uh, this committee has not traditionally. Oh, am I telling fibs here? Yeah, it looks like the agenda does suggest a, a vice chair. I, I was not remembering that we had a vice chair. It actually hasn't been utilized in committee before, but for purposes of um, keeping it consistent, I think that'd probably be a good idea. And for consistency purposes, should probably be a, a council member. I'll nominate Councilor Feeble Corn. Second. That was not where I was going with that, but thank you. <laughs> There's been a motion and a second to um, appoint Councillor Feeblecorn as the vice chair. Uh, may second. we call for a vote, please? Councillor Benton. Yes. Mr. Doran. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Mr. Pulley. Yes. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Mr. Davis. Yes. That passes unanimously. Thank you. And I do make a, a motion that we adjourn the guidelines committee meeting for today. Do I have a second? Very quickly, if I may. Yes, Mr. Uh, Gutierrez. Miss uh, Councillor Fiblecorn asked for some information. Who do I send that to so I can get that to her? You can send it directly to me. I'll put my uh, email in the chat box if that's helpful. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Second. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, Councillor Fiblecorn, we don't have a chat box on this Zoom. There is no um, chat. I will reach out to you, Rocky. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mandy. I we have a vote and a second for adjournment. Can you call the vote, please? Councilor Benton. Yes. Mr. Doran. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Mr. Doran. <laughs> yes. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Mr. David. Yes. That's unanimous. Thank you, committee. Um, and thank you for the unions, Rocky, everybody for their presentations. They're very informative and we did, I think we all got a lot out of it. And I appreciate y'all's time on a Tuesday afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Have a good day, everybody. Take care.